What makes a news article trustworthy? Does the organization have to be 100% unbiased? Does the reporter have to be thorough and professional? Does the reporter have to exist? These are the questions we'll be tackling today. Before we get going, I want to give a quick content notice that we're going to have some discussion of suicidality, gender dysphoria, and transphobia in this video. Now then, as much as I'm sick of hearing people yell fake news, we have to admit that there are a lot of problems with the legitimacy and trustworthiness of reporting these days. And there probably always has been. But now, with the 24-hour news cycle and the mass amount of news online, I think any of us who can name 10 news outlets can name at least 5 untrustworthy ones. Though more and more people are trusting what they read online, news found through social media is considered the least trustworthy by people, despite being an increasing source of news and even the most common source of news for people 18 to 29 years old in the US, according to a 2018 survey. Recently, I fell down a rabbit hole related to one of the most successful publishers of news in the entire world of social media, consistently at the top of lists of successful publishers on Facebook, The Daily Wire. So we're going to take a look at one of their stories for a case study in news trustworthiness. I unfortunately use social media, specifically Twitter, which by the way you can check me out on once you're done subscribing to this YouTube channel. On Twitter, I stumbled across a post from The Daily Wire that got my attention. It was sharing this article from their website. I had just been arguing with a close friend about how legislation protecting the rights of trans people doesn't infringe on the rights of others, so this article caught my eye as something that could potentially challenge my position. It seemed a bit sensational, and I knew The Daily Wire explicitly has a conservative bias, but I didn't think that gave me permission to just avoid the story. If the story was true in any way resembling how the headline put it, that would really seem to disprove my position. Well, before we even get to the headline, let's take a look at the byline. You always want to check that out. We can see who gets credit for writing the article. Something immediately struck me about the name of the author, Hank Berrien. I don't know, it just felt off. Ben Shapiro, a founder of The Daily Wire and a lawyer known for debating college students, had this whole thing back in 2016 where it came to light that his dad was using a pseudonym at Breitbart when Ben worked there. Which all came out when he and his dad left Breitbart because even Ben Shapiro apparently has standards. Knowing about this, I had this vague association in my head between Ben's work and pseudonyms, and since I am unfortunately never far from Twitter, my suspicions led me back there, where I checked if Hank Berrien had a page, since it's almost universal that reporters use Twitter. It was immediately clear that we were not dealing with a normal situation by the mere 36 followers Hank had, and the fact that the account was directly tweeting insults at Ben Shapiro. That would be odd for someone employed by the Daily Wire, no? I mean, you can be pro-free speech, but most people don't want their employees shit-talking them on Twitter. We can see here a fan of his writing tweeted helpfully to Hank, Great article, but Chuck Jenkins is the sheriff of Frederick County, Maryland. Maryland, not Frederick County, Virginia, just wanted to let you know. And this Hank Berrien account responded, For years I've been asking Ben Shapiro and self-proclaimed hashtag God King Jeremy D. Boring to hire a copy editor, but they don't listen to me because I'm not a real person. <laughs> We can only wonder at what the fan of Hank thought of this, because alas, the wonderful comment did not get a like or a reply. So at this moment, I'm on the edge of my seat, galloping rapidly down the rabbit hole. Impersonation is not allowed on Twitter. Who can forget the classic that apparently got Jabuki's verified status stripped, or got him temporarily suspended or something? I don't know, it's hard to keep track since it's happened I think multiple times. Kinda makes sense that impersonation wouldn't be allowed, you know? I mean, I can't be against misinformation while having an issue with these companies making efforts to prohibit 
impersonation. So why is this Hank Berrien account allowed on Twitter? They follow people from the Daily Wire and they tweet at them. They're not trying to be discreet. Well, it's been less than a year, so I guess we'll see, but can it really be considered impersonation if the entity being impersonated isn't an existing person? Lawyers, please let me know in the comments. Anyway, I went back to the article with these kinds of questions kicking around in my head. I think it would be silly to talk about pseudonyms and trustworthiness of news without getting into the details of the specific case in question. So we're going to dive in for a minute or two to this article. Only by going into the details can we begin to understand exactly why the author used a pseudonym. The first thing a critical eye might notice is that in the article's headline, the word after plays an interesting role by obscuring whether it describes causation or correlation. Did the father get a arrested simply for misgendering his child one time by accident or a few times by accident or a few times on purpose? What happened? Is this a result of that Bill C-16 that Jordan Peterson made hundreds of thousands of dollars misrepresenting? Short answer, no, not at all, but let's get into it. I'm not exaggerating. Hank Berrien misgenders the 14-year-old boy in this story 13 times in the first five sentences. It's as if this article exists just to repeatedly misgender this child. I decided to fix it for my video to make my video not painful for people because it's a fact that I care about people's feelings. If you're wondering why do I have the right to change an article from a supposed news site but the news article doesn't get to change things from court filings as we'll see, luckily the trustworthiness of this type of judgment is exactly what we're here to talk about. I'm changing the pronouns to respect the feelings of this child and to respect the idea that people self-determine their identity. I'm not just doing this to be nice or seem woke. I think people get to self-determine their identity within reasonable limits. And this is clearly within reasonable limits because gender identity is obviously different from sex, and not even sex is binary or fixed universally in nature. So why would gender identity be binary or fixed, even if it was the same thing as sex, which it is absolutely not? So I respect people's pronouns, obviously. As we can see, this case centers around the boy having to go to court because his dad went to court to stop his medical treatment. So with my translation of the Daily Wire article with the pronouns, we can read uh, the Daily Wire say that the father, quote, cited his son's alleged history of mental health issues and refused to give permission. Doctors at BC Children's Hospital decided the boy should receive testosterone injections. Yeah, it's not that simple, but just wait and see. I'm a licensed therapist, but you don't have to be to know that a child's well-being will not be improved by his father refusing to acknowledge his gender identity. A parent doing this is essentially saying, I won't talk to my child, since they're refusing to accept the significant aspect of them, and therefore refusing to engage with them as they are. There are so many things that a parent can misunderstand about their child, but gender identity is a very significant one with broad and deep consequences. Usually, this alienation parents cause through their ignorance doesn't result in public news, but this father was determined to make his feelings known. This issue hinges on the questions, how much agency can children have? Have, and who gets to make this determination. We'll get into some details that will show why this situation is so hard for children, but briefly let's note that this father, if you didn't already suspect this, isn't rational. He's quoted in another article that Hank Berry in quotes as saying, is BC Children's Hospital going to be there in five years? in reference to this father's false assertion that his son was undergoing some experimental treatment. The father added, No, they're not. They don't care. They just want numbers. Okay, so since my video today is one about critical thinking and trusting sources, let's consider this point that is unquestionably quoted by Mr. Hank Berrien. The British Columbia Children's Hospital has a history going back to well before when it began seeing patients at its current location, which was in 1982. But 
Even if we just take 1982 as its beginning, the hospital has been chugging along for almost 40 years. Like, I know a lot of hospitals have financial issues here and there, especially in the last year where many of them have lost a ton of money because they had to stop all but the most urgent non-COVID care. But if a hospital is going to close, I'm pretty sure, despite what this random father said, it's not going to be related to its pediatric endocrinology unit. So the Daily Wire article links to a 2019 decision of the Supreme Court of British Columbia about this case, and I read it, and the child in question transitioned at age 11 in 2015, has been recognized as a boy since then, and is enrolled in school under his current name. He saw a psychologist a couple years ago and was diagnosed with gender dysphoria, the condition of being significantly distressed by the gender you were assigned at birth as a result of your biological sex. According to filings in court, he was referred to an experienced pediatric endocrinologist who supported the treatment of testosterone hormone therapy to achieve his goals and help him live a happy life. Then his dad told the doctors that he didn't consent to his son's therapy. The dad's consent wasn't needed, though, and when he found that out, he got an order from the provincial court to halt the hormone treatment. We read in this Supreme Court decision that the doctors became concerned that the boy's health was suffering and that he was at risk of hurting himself, since he had attempted suicide within the previous year in connection with his gender dysphoria symptoms. Another doctor was brought in and determined that the boy was able to provide informed consent, that is, to sign off that he wanted hormone therapy. Look at all these doctors being careful. This is not a rushed process. This is a process determined to continue, despite attempts at stopping it. That doesn't mean it's rushed, just because it's determined to continue. One doctor reviewed the work of the other doctors and wrote, In the case of a child who is dealing with gender identity issues and who has previously attempted suicide, there is a significant risk of further attempts and possibly even completion if treatment is delayed. Keep in mind, puberty was coming thick and fast for this 14-year-old, and with every new day of puberty came more painful dysphoria. And so, here we are in the Supreme Court two years ago, in February 2019, and the judge agrees that hormone treatment cannot be delayed, and refers to the father as being, quote, disingenuous and submitting expert opinions that didn't discuss his son specifically. Then the order ends with an extended publication ban, prohibiting any parties from disclosing the identity of the 14-year-old boy and stating that attempting to persuade the boy to abandon treatment for gender dysphoria, addressing him by his birth name, referring to him as a girl or with female pronouns, whether to him directly or to third parties, shall be considered to be family violence under Section 38 of the Family Law Act. I took a look at Section 38, and it defines family violence as mentioned in the Section 37 preceding it, which discusses how the best interests of a child should be considered by the law. Section 38 defines family violence by stating that a court must consider all of the following, and I'll highlight a few of them. The nature and seriousness of the family violence how recently the family violence occurred, whether the family violence was directed towards the child, the harm to the child's physical, psychological, and emotional safety, security, and well-being as a result of the family violence, and any steps the person responsible for the family violence has taken to prevent further family violence from occurring, which in the case of the father we're talking about are zero steps since the father is publicly unrepentant. Hank Berrien doesn't go this deep, but stops at the quote from the Supreme Court mentioning the Family Law Act, leaving it to the conservative reader's imagination to devise some terrible oppressive laws rather than laws meant to protect vulnerable children. It took a court to tell this father not to publicly misgender, effectively out and dox his child, and he still did it multiple times. Because, see, this wasn't a case of an overzealous judge. That ruling was two years ago, and then a year ago, the father was explicitly forced to stop a series of interviews he was doing on YouTube where he was misgendering his son. Look at this exchange the judge had with him then, and ask yourself whether he could have foreseen what happened this year. What it clearly means is that what you cannot do is give interviews that are likely to be broadcast in any way, in any form, and that's what has occurred here, the judge told the dad. You're simply not not entitled to do that, sir. Do you understand that part of it? Replied the dad, I completely understand that part of it, yes. 
The judge reminded the dad of the bans on the names of the parties in the case and said he had violated the orders. You must not do that, sir. You are in breach of the court order, said the judge. I mean, the reason I do it or did it, which is a great slip to notice, is because I am taking the best interests of my child at heart, said the dad. The judge warned the dad that if there are any further breaches of the bans and court orders, the lawyers for the teen might come back to court and seek to have him cited for contempt of court and face serious consequences. And so that's what happened this year. So the dad had to turn himself in because he broke the order again and they sent out an arrest warrant for him. I'm not a lawyer, but this seems like an open and shut contempt of court situation. He did exactly what the court ordered him not to do. If you think the court was wrong to tell him to do that, consider this. In what situations do you think it's okay and necessary for a court or the state to intervene in family matters? Is child abuse okay? I hope you agree that child abuse is not a right that parents possess. And what's the difference between grossly and publicly exacerbating your child's gender dysphoria even when they've already attempted suicide and child abuse? This is a very sad story, a father unable to accept his son, and currently the father is banking tens of thousands of dollars through crowdfunding. He considers this a free speech issue, but people need to remember that just like you aren't free to yell fire in a crowded theater, you aren't free to harass and abuse other people, even your own children. Or, unfortunately, really, most verbal child abuse probably flies well under the radar of the law because, remember, this father is not being arrested for child abuse. He's being arrested for contempt of court, but it's contempt of court because he's harming a vulnerable child against a court's order based on the family law in British Columbia. I really tried for quite a while to find the arrest warrant and checked many sources, but most of the outlets interested in this case don't seem too concerned concerned with the facts of it, so I couldn't find the warrant. If you are against this arrest warrant being issued, I would ask you two questions. One, do you consider the significant harm that misgendering causes, especially in this case? And two, if you do, why shouldn't the father be held in contempt? And how else do you propose to stop his public misgendering of his minor son? If you are somehow against misgendering but also against the court exerting its power here, you must be Hank Berrien because I don't think a person like that exists. Frankly, I do think courts should have power to enforce their rulings, otherwise rulings lack any meaning. And though there are times when breaking the law is noble, this is definitely not one of them because harm is being done. And if you don't think harm is being done, I hope you never have to realize how wrong you are by knowing a teenager who suffers like this. And so then, that's the story, okay? Hank's Daily Wire article is literally reinforcing the harm done to this child publicly and repeatedly to prove a point that it thinks it's making about free speech and to reduce gender to sex to promote conservative values and so on. Isn't it pretty pathetic and ironic that the author of this Daily Wire article, whoever it is, gets to have anonymity while the kid with the loudly transphobic dad doesn't anymore? When I realized how the father's contempt of court arrest was a seemingly justified use of state power, I got pretty stubborn about getting to the bottom of this Hank Berrien situation. So he's just fake? He's just a made up guy? But someone wrote this. Does the reader not deserve to know who's writing the words on this website? Who is choosing how to frame and interpret things? Imagine reading about this story through Hank's lens and never knowing he's a sock puppet non-person, because many people do that. You see this story on social media and you read it, and who, or you just see the headline and you read it, and who do you end up concerned about? If you're transphobic, maybe it's the father, and if you have empathy and understanding, it will obviously be the son that you worry about. Who is going to think, gosh, I'm worried about the author of this article. I hope they're not in harm's way from writing about this just like 500 other conservative media outlets did. I'm not saying Ben Shapiro or others would be unable to try to make attempts to allege that a pseudonym is necessary here. I'm sure they've gotten death threats and so on, but so do real journalists. If you can't stand the heat, Get out of the kitchen. Don't stand in the kitchen in full camouflage screaming hateful shit. If we somehow granted the absurd idea that a pseudonym is necessary for this article, tell me, why was it also necessary for the many, many, many other articles of Hank Berrien? Was Hank at risk of death threats when he wrote this gem? What about this? Did this article put Hank at risk? 
And what about this one, which we absolutely will come back to? No, of course not. None of these articles by Hank create more risk for a quote-unquote him than serious articles by real reporters. And here's an interesting thing I found that The Daily Wire does. In the search box where you can type a journalist's name, typing Hank or Hank Berrien doesn't retrieve any results like it would, you know, like it would <laughs> if Hank was a real person. But if we go to one of his terrible articles, we can easily click his name and find the rest of them. So at some point, someone at the Daily Wire's website or administration decided that letting people search by the name Hank Berrien was taking the sock puppet person thing too far, which I find interesting. As we'll see before we finish, they don't hide Hank from their author's page, though. So if it's not consistently the case that this pseudonym is used to protect the safety of the author or authors, what else can we suggest except that the pseudonym is used to protect the career of the author or authors? At the end of the day, this is extremely shitty and bad faith writing, with no attempt to give a balanced look and no qualms about journalistic standards or basic human decency. So I completely reject the notion that a pseudonym is necessary, and I absolutely think the burden of proof is on the organization allowing sock puppet names to write hundreds of articles for them. So who is Hank? There's this article we took a quick look at earlier which digs into speculation that Hank is another William Bigelow from Breitbart, another sock puppet for Ben Shapiro's dad, due to the numerous articles by Hank very explicitly in support of Ben and his feelings. The article cites several people on Twitter who've taken a look into Hank. This one Twitter user seemed to be one of the first and points out this Hank Berrien article that does nothing but very briefly repeat and support Ben Shapiro's joke slash is it a joke that he could have been on the Supreme Court. Ha ha ha. Just kidding, unless we have a conservative president willing to put ridiculously unqualified lawyers in positions of power. And speaking of supporting Ben's feelings, let's look back at one article I just mentioned, this one. I can't help myself, I'm sorry. If you've made it this far, you should be able to handle this, but you can drop out of the video at this point, I understand. It may look like a news article, but it is essentially just bumping a YouTube video someone made about how awesome Ben is at debating. The video pokes some friendly fun at how Ben talks, but clearly aims to propagate the idea that Ben is a successful debater and his opponents are irrelevant rational children. We can see the creator's starstruck response to Ben sharing the video online, and also this other guy's response who we do not need to talk about him right now. I want to show a clip from this as one final case study in misinformation. There's one main point I want to call out. So you've supported like this really racist idea that healthcare should not uh, be for free. And I just wanted to ask about that. Okay, so here's how this works, gang. Honestly, if you can't see that a universal healthcare system is bad for America, you're wasting my time, okay? Okay, folks, so the healthcare cost crisis didn't actually begin until the government got involved by creating Medicare and Medicaid because when you artificially stimulate demand, there's no incentive to lower price. Not to mention, you are not entitled to the product of somebody else's labor. Wait, 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 hold on there, buddy. What was that? Artificially stimulate demand. The creation of Medicare and Medicaid artificially stimulated demand, fake Ben? Demand for what, healthcare? You're telling me the demand for healthcare is artificially stimulated because millions of people now have access to it? Okay, I'll keep this short because I'm responding to a joke. But this is how ideas get propagated. They get snuck in jokes like Trojan horse guys, and obviously a lot of people do believe this and think that Ben was arguing well in the video. So what is it? So some people might use their Medicare and Medicaid plans for potentially unnecessary treatments, so now we're saying that there's artificial demand for healthcare? Artificial compared to what? The free market state where people with pre-existing conditions can't get a policy they can afford because insurance providers jack up the price of coverage? Making something more accessible does not equate to creating artificial demand for it, since we can't compare against any natural or control state of the healthcare industry. Healthcare should not be for profit, in my opinion. People are suffering and need better healthcare in the United States, where costs are some of the highest in the world. The continually rising healthcare costs in the US don't stem from artificially stimulated demand, but instead stem from the huge aging population and the administrative waste of providers interacting with the complex network of very successful insurance companies. What Medicare and Medicaid do is pump tax dollar money into the health insurance industry to lower costs for millions of people by artificially stimulating competition not demand. It's stimulating competition and forcing prices down, not stimulating demand and forcing prices up. 
If I'm wrong about that, please let me know in the comments, but I've worked in the healthcare industry for years, so I have some sense of how many people I've worked with who were only able to get sober or only able to get family therapy because of the state investing in Medicaid and subsidizing artificially cheap plans. But okay, I can't keep arguing with this cartoon version of Ben Shapiro. I will lose my mind. Or maybe maybe I should put that in the past tense. Maybe it's already happened. So anyway, Hank loves Ben a lot, supports him a lot, but isn't in a monogamous relationship with The Daily Wire. He's submitted articles to all these many, many websites and more. And interestingly, Hank used to be a never-Trumper, we can see, just like Ben and Ben's dad, David Shapiro, were. And this anti-Trump article was very interestingly published less than a month after Ben and his father left Breitbart for multiple reasons, one of which was Breitbart's sycophantic support for Trump. As a brief note, just to explain, when Ben chose to leave Breitbart, Breitbart published, I think in the middle of the night, a very uh, insulting article about Ben under his dad's pseudonym, William Bigelow, which basically forced the truth out that William Bigelow was a pseudonym. And I don't really understand exactly how, but forced it to come out that it was Ben's dad, David Shapiro, writing those articles, many of which were extremely positive about Ben. So anyways, does this alignment of them leaving Breitbart partially because of Breitbart's support for Trump and Hank Berrien writing a Never Trump article, does that alignment sort of prove or provide evidence for Hank Berrien being Ben or maybe more likely David Shapiro? Honestly, it doesn't really matter that much who Hank Berrien is or whether it's one person or many. There are many people with hateful and ignorant views who will staunchly oppose the equal treatment of marginalized groups because they can and because it's profitable. What's important is that the rest of us keep improving in our ability to critically analyze information, especially information that parades itself in the fashion of news. I recommend asking yourself three questions when you're wondering if you can trust an article. One, what's the impact, the overall impact of this story? Two, does the overall impact of this story align with the impact of the majority of stories from the outlet about this subject? And three, what does that tell me? Lastly, I want to mention one thing. If you are a very critical thinker, this may have crossed your mind already. I'm anonymous. On this channel, I don't use my real name. Believe it or not, my full legal name is not what's therapy with a question mark. But at least I'm one anonymous person making all this content, not an undeterminable number of anonymous people making a bunch of content. And even if I did get help from people I didn't name in my videos, there would still be a clear and unmistakable continuity of authorship. Plus, I'm not presenting myself as a news outlet. If Hank Berrien wants to be anonymous, they can do so on a blog or a YouTube channel, but a media outlet that intentionally resembles news needs higher expectations. I see that the Daily Wire is careful to call itself a conservative media company rather than a news organization, and they acknowledge their bias as well, but they present an enormous amount of information under the heading news and use the word news a lot clearly acting as a news organization would in appearance and in behavior. Nice of them to acknowledge their bias on one hidden page of their website, but since this is the internet, people are stumbling across their articles literally by the tens of millions and hardly ever reading this about page, so they do real harm by presenting misinformation as news all around the internet, including on Facebook, where they're regularly one of the top sources of clicks, as we talked about. But there's also a big difference between my anonymous YouTube channel and Hank Berrien's anonymous articles because Hank sits alongside living, breathing humans who write articles for this site. This obscures the fact that he's a sock puppet. Very, very strangely, and with a sort of hubris, Hank actually sits at the top of the list on the author's page. But as we can see when we click on him, he doesn't have a bio like the others do. Call me crazy, but I trust authors that have a bio. And I don't trust content from authors who don't. We gave it a shot, okay? We, even though we knew it would be biased, we looked in deep and we gave it a shot. Good for us. Thanks for watching and going down this rabbit hole with me. If you enjoyed this, you can check out the other videos. I have a few others about harmful conservative rhetoric, like these ones, and I have a few about awesome media people, like these ones, and there's a whole bunch more about things you may be interested in, like these ones. Please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to, and support the channel by sending videos to your friends, sharing them online, and if you're feeling really, really wild, supporting the channel on Patreon.
Please let me know in the comments if you have any information about Hank Berrien or his whereabouts, and we will get to the bottom of this rabbit hole together. Thanks.